Hello, my name is Chris Morin. I'm going to be walking you through some basic routing concepts in uh, regards to Cisco devices. Um, right in front of you, you have a, a, a layout of the, the uh, scenario that we're going to be working with. I have not configured I, either of the routers for anything, um, so as we walk through this and configure them, I uh, will show you the uh, configuration processes as well. Um, basically, the, the, the simplest way I can explain routing is uh, having one router have the capability of knowing where it sends its packets in order for them to get to their destination. The best metaphor I can come up with this is similar to that of a FedEx or a post office. Whereas each post office point needs to know the next post office point in order for that letter to reach its ultimate destination. So, in order for that to happen in the routing world, the different routers need to be able to talk to each other and tell each other where these points are and how they are in, in a reference to their current location. Now, another way that routers can figure them out is with a, a very, very, very basic configuration called static routing, which is the first thing we're going to configure. Now, this is basically the uh, the manual definition of the path the packet will have to take through your network. So on each router I will have to tell it each destination network and how to get there. Now there's a couple of good things about doing it this way. It, re it removes the overhead of having a dynamic routing protocol, meaning if you have old hardware or if it's not a very complex environment, you uh, won't have to have a CPU intensive um, protocol running in your memory and uh, in uh, in your CPU on your router. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't uh, dynamically check things or anything. So it's very simple. Another pro is security. Um, no IP packet can go anywhere unless you tell it it can unless you can tell it it has a place to go. So if you are in an environment where you need to explicitly allow only certain things, then it is also a, a capable solution. However, they come with a couple of cons. Um, one of which is that you literally have to individually configure each route, and that is very administrator intensive. It's uh, actually freaking annoying. Um, if you are in a, a large environment, a corporate environment, or a, an enterprise environment, you're going to have to enter a lot of routes and they can get very cluttered and very hard to follow and very difficult to document. So that's annoying. Another con is that there's no failback. If a static route goes down and that destination is no longer a reasonable way to get to that route, your router is not going to be able to figure out another way to get there, which is annoying. Um, so really fast, let's go ahead and go in and configure these routers. I'm going to go ahead and create loopback interfaces for the uh, ones I've listed on there. And I'm also going to go ahead and configure the serial interface with what I believe is 172. 172.16.12.1 I always do that. I always mark it as slash 32. It should have been slash 30. I'm sorry about that. Do a clock rate of 9600. No shut. And that is all we need. Okay. And uh, now I'm going to pause the video and go ahead and do that on the other router as well. Okay, so now from where I am, router 1 can ping the other side to router 2. And router 2 can do the same thing backwards. Alright, now that we have that configured, um, we want router 1 to be able to reach the 2.2.2.1 address. Can do that now. Not a chance. 
So we're going to do this by configuring a static route. Now the uh, the easiest way to do this is well, you know, there isn't really a complicated way to do this. You go to configure terminal and you type in the command IP route the destination address, which in this case is 2.2.2.1, and the next hop address, which in this case is 172.16.12.2. And you want to make sure you have the subnet mask for that address. You hit enter. Now watch looks like I can get there now. Now, we want router 2 to be able to reach 1.1.1.1, can it now? No. So we're going to have to configure the exact same command on it. So we go to IP route 1.1.1.1 it's subnet mask and the next top address which is 172.16.12.1 you have to make that command to configure terminal. Can it ping it now? Yes, it can. Only that was the uh, wrong IP address. There you go. All right, and uh, now we can move on to the topic of dynamic routing protocols. Now the router um, has a way of figuring out which routing protocol it prefers to get to its route. So say I have a couple of different routing protocols like RIP or EIGRIP or OSPF running concurrently and they all have the ability to go to the same destination. Well it uses something called administrative distance to figure out the, uh, the route that it prefers. Now the Cisco, um, Cisco has default administrative distance values and these are them. If the, if the um, route is directly connected, it will always use that one first. If you have statically defined that route, it will use that one if it's not directly connected, and it goes up from there. Um, EI grip would be the next preferred one. OSPF is preferred after that. RIP is after that, and EI grip is uh, externally is after that. Um, and we'll go into the configurations of all of those later, but that's a, uh, a table you will probably need to memorize if you're going for a uh, Cisco Certified Entry Level Network Technician or a Cisco Certified Network uh, um, Associate. So go ahead and write that down. And um, once, uh, once it, it uses that, um, each of those different routing protocols have a different uh, way of figuring out how to get to the destination. And um, some of them are better than other ones, and I'll show you what they are. Um, RIP, which is what we're going to be dealing with um, for CSENT, uh, uses hop count. In other words, the amount of routers it has to go through to get to its destination. Um, essentially, uh, if router 1 wanted to ping this one via RIP, it would have one hop count to get to it. Um, uh, and if it goes any higher than 15 hop counts, then to RIP it doesn't even exist, which is uh, aggravating. EIG RIP uses a combination of bandwidth and delay on the line to determine which destination it has as the most reliable. And OSPF uses cost, which is a different um, type of uh, formula that it uses to determine what the best circuit is and, and what the cumulative uh, cost of all of the links to its destination are. Um, so those are the different ones. Uh, and we'll get to configuring them and explain those more in detail later along the line. Today we're going to be talking about a distance uh, vector routing protocol called RIP. Now what RIP uh, does that defines as a dis distance vector routing protocol is uh, you know, pretty simple. Uh, it will always periodically over a certain time period uh, broadcast its entire routing table out of all of its interfaces. and when it receives these broadcasts, it will always believe it, no matter what. It doesn't cross-reference anything. Um, and those are, those are you know, characteristics of distance vector routing protocols. There's another type called a link state routing protocol, which OSPF is an example of. And uh, each router is able to figure out um, its own uh, view of the network. 
and it uses information from other routers to build its own um, uh, list of destination addresses and, and hop locations and where to send networks. So it's, it's much more of a, uh, a reliable means of communication compared to distance vector. Um, but that being said, we still need to be, be able to configure these two. And uh, because this is an entry uh, example, let's go ahead and just configure RIP to do it. So I'm going to go into router 1, configure terminal, go into the router RIP um, command, we have to configure version 2, and we have to do no auto summary. Now what those commands do is uh, version 2, when it came out, enabled RIP to not rely on a classful routing. So you can use a, it, it checks and, and sends subnet masks along with its um, broadcasts for updates. And an auto summary, of course, tells you that it is not going to be a summarized address, that it will have to um, use the, the subnet mask associated with it. So we can go ahead and add the network command and advertise 1.1.1.2. And also for giggles, Let's advertise 172.16.12.1. And we can do the same thing for router 2. All right. Now, can they ping each other? Let's see. No, no it can't. I wonder why. Do you have any ideas? Did I miss something obvious? I wonder if that had anything to do with it. I'm such a moron. <laughs> And that actually shouldn't have broken it. That should have made me not be able to ping 1.1.1.1, but I'll explain to you what happened in just a second. No network, 1.1.1.12, and network, 1.1.1.2. I did it again almost. Okay, um, let's try and ping it again. See how it worked that time and I didn't change anything on router 2? Um, remember when I mentioned that uh, distance vector protocols broadcast their addresses? Well, um, there's a timer that uh, RIP has which is default 30 seconds and where it will update its, uh, it'll broadcast out its uh, routing table. So you'll always have to wait for that update when a routing, when a, when a, a route gets updated. Which means that it'll be 30 seconds if a route goes down before anyone else knows about it. Which is not cool. So to test these, these things we have a couple commands we can run. We can run show IP route and that will show me everything that router1 knows and how it knows about it. It knows about the 2.2.2.2 subnet via RIP, which is what the R stands for. It knows the dot one subnet statically assigned. Now a couple things I want to point out here is what these uh, these indications actually mean. Now that first number, if, if it seems familiar, it's because you've seen it before. That's the metric, or sorry, <laughs> that's the administrative distance that a uh, Cisco has assigned for that route. And RIP is 120. The second one is the metric, which is the amount of hops, in this case, because it's RIP, that it, it takes to get to that destination. Like I said, it would be one hop. Um, now, the statically assigned one, as also referenced here, has one for its administrative distance and uh, zero for its metric, and I believe that's because statically assigned addresses don't have a metric. I could be wrong. I don't really <laughs> deal with statically assigned addresses that much, um, so don't quote me on that. But um. The uh, that's that's pretty much it, and uh, you know you have the table of contents here, and you have all the different types of routing protocols that exist, and there's a lot more than what I'm teaching you now. But uh, the technology is there, and unfortunately, because of time constraints, I pretty much have to end now. But I appreciate you taking the time to go through here and learn a couple basic routing concepts from static routes, default routes. Oh, I didn't talk about default routes. Oh, really fast. A default route is basically a route of last resort, so I can type an IP route. 0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .